Well, hello, everybody. So sorry I couldn't be there in person. I've been really enjoying the conference so far, both from hearing through the eyes or listening through the eyes of the caregivers, as well as from the scientific and research community, uh, really engaging discussions so far. So uh, my congratulations to everybody who took part in organizing. And I know we're in the early stages still of a multi-day event, um, but I'm really uh, excited and looking forward to hearing the other talkers and speakers and, present and listening to their presentations as the uh, next few days unfold. Um, so I'm going to jump in and I trust everybody can see my PowerPoint. Um, by way of quick background, because I know we have a, a fairly narrow time slot, um, I'm a 50-year-old fella up here in Toronto, Canada. I'm a, a husband to uh, my wife, Christina, and I'm a father of two teenagers, 14 and 16 years old. Um, I'm currently getting care through the Princess Margaret Hospital in uh, downtown Toronto, one of the leading cancer centers here in our fine northern country of Canada. Uh, I was diagnosed with Crohn's and colitis back in 87. Uh, I, I, went, I, I went through quite a number of different treatments and ultimately uh, uh, had a proctolectomy where my colon and part of my small bowel was removed. And through the journey of having Crohn's and colitis, we discovered that I also had PSC. Not uncommon for those of you that have PSC when you have an autoimmune disorder like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Uh, to show symptoms of, of scarring and inflammation in the bile ducts. Your autoimmune system seems to attack those bile ducts similar to what it was doing in my earlier life with my colon. Um, but because of having the PSE diagnosis, I've been monitored very closely in no small part to attempt to catch an early onset of potentially cholangiocarcinoma. Um, and after 20 years, my gastroenterologist, who's also a very close personal friend of mine now, uh, he would tell me, Scott, you're, you're going to die of, like one thing I can say with near certainty is you're going to die of something and it won't be, but you won't, it won't be PSC. Um, because we'd had such a long track record of having, you know, very good health, excellent lab work. Uh, I never really was symptomatic of PSC. If I didn't have multitudes of ERCPs and other tests done for other reasons, I wouldn't have known I had PSC. It wasn't because I presented symptomatic. I'd never been jaundiced in the past, et cetera. Um, so because of the close monitoring uh, for the last many, many years, um, we noticed, even though I was asymptomatic, we noticed my CA-199 started to climb as far back as December of 2019. Um, and that CA-199, and I've got a graph here, you can see it on the left side of that curve, um, started to climb almost exponentially in a very consistent climb. We started to watch it uh, almost every few weeks I would get lab work done. Um, up until about 1,000, uh, we thought it could have just been a, a minor inflammation of the bile ducts. Um, there were no, no indication of any uh, blockage, but we thought that there might be something not quite showing up, and that could be causing the CA-199. It's not uncommon. Uh, for a dominant stricture to throw off uh, a higher level of CA-99 that's otherwise benign. But it just kept going. It kept going, it kept going, and it got close to 10,000 at its peak. Um, so in and around the point when it's about 6,000, uh, I was referred to surgical oncology here in Toronto uh, with the notion that if my PSC was going to get worse as I get older, the common treatment path is ultimately a liver transplant. And with the rising CA-99, even though we couldn't get any definitive biopsy, even though we attempted it numerous times with brushings, et cetera, via ERCP, um, we had nothing showing up in CTs or MRCPs. Um, we just had to take it under suspicion that with my PSC background and with this es escalating CA-99, odds are it's there. We just, didn't, we just didn't know where it was or it hadn't shown itself yet. Um, and so this becomes a common uh, situation, I know, for many that are in the early stages of diagnosis, or at least if you have the luck of being uh, in the early stages and are catching this before you become symptomatic, it's one of the tougher cancers to find. Particularly in my case, I'm extra hepatic, so I presented uh, ultimately in the end as a more traditional clat skin tumor or right at the bifurcation of the left-right common ducts, uh, left-right hepatic ducts in the common duct. Um, but nothing showed up. Brushing showed up negative. Uh, again, imaging was showing up as clean. Uh, I was worked up for a liver transplant. We, uh, I had a live donor that was a match, a uh, family member that volunteered. Um, I, ironically, I was denied the, the transplantation because I was deemed 
and I air quote, too I was deemed to be too healthy. Uh, later, um, uh, literally a week later, the, the updated MRCP showed a mass that went right from you're too healthy to have a transplant to you're too large, you fail the Mayo protocol for transplantation. Um, not only because the tumor went from zero to four and a half centimeters by two and a half centimeters, but it also um, uh, showed spread to my nearby regional uh, periodontal lymph nodes. Um, we were able to ultimately biopsy the lymph nodes through an endoscopic ultrasound guided ERCP. Uh, and that's, that definitive diagnosis is what allowed for me to at least start treatment. So I did get a referral to um, Mayo Clinic as well through this lead up. And they acknowledged that it is challenging, but highly suspicious that my CA-99 was climbing. They say it's certainly not unusual that it doesn't show up uh, at that stage on scans. Um, uh, but in my case, uh, I, I went right from you're too healthy for the potentially curative transplant to you're too sick for a transplant uh, and you need to pursue systemic treatment. Um, I, was a, I was still hopeful uh, after that early prognosis that I might still be a candidate in the, in the not too distant future for, for some form of surgery, namely a resection. Um, I, I found, and I'm happy to still have in my corner, one of the more aggressive surgeons here in Toronto General, Dr. Ian McGilbrey. And um, he felt that this was still resectable, even though most who looked at my file felt that it was inoperable by nature of where it's situated. Um, but he's done a lot of these complex procedures. And, and like many of the successful surgeons around the world who do these, um, his one of his strengths is, is in transplantation. So he's very familiar with taking organs onto the back bench in a really complex scenario and re reconstructing what's needed and then, and then like an auto transplant and then put it back in and connect it all up. Um, so he was proposing a fairly aggressive surgery for me, uh, resection of the liver where the tumor had infiltrated. So mine's an infiltrative type of uh, cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, I've got two metal stents uh, one into the left and one into the right hepatic ducts. Uh, one of the two is extending right down into the distal uh, common duct. And uh, that's kept me very, my liver very healthy. My liver tests are excellent. Um, my bilirubin is extremely low, lower almost than it's been pre-diagnosis and has been consistently for the last 18 months since my diagnosis back in uh, 2020. And uh, he was, so the surgery was deemed to be reasonable if I showed stability over a period of six cycles of gem cis. Um, so we completed the six cycles. My CA-99, CA if I go back up to this graph for a second, you can see how as soon as I started chemo, the graph dipped from that near 10,000 mark down into the um, 2,500 to 3,000 range. Um, and that was when I, I had to start my chemo washout. Um, in hindsight, with the benefit of hindsight, I think I should have kept going on the chemo and we tried, tried to just see how far down that curve we could have written it as neoadjuvant treatment pre-surgery. But, uh, but I, was, I was told and I still, I guess, stand behind the fact that it, it makes sense to, sorry, flipping slides around on you all. It makes sense when the surgery options are made available. We're all very hopeful that surgery has curative potential and, and it's hard to turn that down and you never know when uh, the surger, surgery viability will change. So if you've got the opportunity, I was told after talking to many professionals, I should take it. Um, so we attempted the surgery in May of 21. Uh, they, they went so far as to get the liver mobilized, but upon mobilizing the liver, they found three suspicious sub-centimeter spots on the diaphragm. Uh, they did OR uh, pathology on site and it tested positive for adenocarcinoma. So at that point, there was consultation with other surgeons done by telephone uh, as to whether they should proceed with the complex resection, including the Whipple, uh, and remove surgically the three, suspicious, uh, the three spots, no longer suspicious. I guess at this point, they'd been pathology tested and proven to be cancerous uh, from the diaphragm with no other evidence of peritoneal disease. But the consult done in real time while I was still on the operating table uh, said, you know what, where there's, where there's a few, there's probably more. So the best recourse would be to promptly get back to systemic treatment. And that's not going to be as readily possible if I'm uh, recovering from a very uh, dynamic and aggressive surgery. So I was sewn back up and the procedure was aborted. 
Um, I did have the tissue that was taken out from the diaphragm sent off to Foundation One. Um, there were mutations, but nothing that is in the mainstay uh, currently for targeted treatments. Uh, for me, uh, MDM2, CDKN2A and B, GNAS and pic 3 r one show up. There are some limited tests going on, um, not always for our cancer, as we heard from doctors earlier today. Um, these aren't all basket treatments. Some of them are, are, are looking at other cancers like breast cancer. For me, MDM2 shows up uh, from, from my local Canadian uh, trials as something that's being uh, pursued potentially for breast cancer, not yet considered or tested for biliary tract cancers. Um, but none of the big names like FGR, uh, the ones that get the most attention uh, came about in my current uh, uh, situation. That's, that could change. Mutations can still occur, as we all know. Um, if I get a chance to get additional uh, tissue, uh, I intend to send it back for retesting. So with surgery aborted and following my brief recovery period, we went back on and I continue to be on gemcitabine and cisplatin to this day. I've actually tolerated it very well. Um, I, I, so I'm lucky in that regard. I know many people struggle with, with gem cis. Um, I, I, I hardly notice I've even had it. Um, I, I'm hungry. I can eat the, uh, the day or the second after I leave the infusion center. Uh, I don't have any nausea to speak of. Um, but the only thing I complain about is I can't sleep on the high dose steroids, the dexamethasone that most often gets prescribed. And I chuckle because that's a, that's a, a simple problem to have versus the alternatives. Um, I have this stance as I already alluded to, um, the gem cyst though has started to have increased, uh, toxicity to my bone marrow. I'm not bouncing back as quick for me. It's most notable in my platelets. And I know from talking to many, uh, on the cholangio carcinoma warriors, uh, Facebook site, and in the foundation's uh, main website chat rooms, that this is not uncommon. Uh, it tends to have a cumulative effect. And if you uh, will either suffer from maybe neutropenia or, uh, or reduced platelets that disallow treatment and you end up skipping appointments. And it's okay, of course, to skip a few. I'm finding I'm skipping too many now. And that's on a dose reduction that's now approaching 50% of both GEM and CIS. Um, so I lobbied to get a Braxane added because I was hearing about the success in the US. Um, I was I was successful and in, in, in turn became the first person in Canada for, with cholangiocarcinoma to have a Braxane uh, that we are aware of to have a Braxane prescribed. And uh, I managed it for one cycle. I did see, and I'm going to do this again and make you dizzy. I did see that uh, um, that there was an additional dip. So if you see the second peak, which is after I was on a chemo washout post-surgery, so there's no chemo when it got, got back up near 10,000, it dropped all the way down into the um, uh, around the 4,500 mark when I had a Braxane added for, for a mere one cycle. So in my opinion, it's, it's while it's, it's only one cycle and it could have been other causes, I'm, I'm going to suggest that a Braxane was working for me. However, for those that keep score on, on the various impacts that these chemotherapies have, a Braxane is notoriously toxic to bone marrow as well. Um, so I ended up having uh, almost zero platelets, had to get a platelet infusion. So we stopped it. Um, now that I'm so low dose on gem cis, I'm looking to add, uh, I'm looking to lobby to add just gem cytabine and a Braxane and drop the cisplatin. And, uh, and, and the theory that, or the hypothesis I'll be bringing to oncology in the next couple of weeks is that we did see a precipitous drop in the CA99. Let's trust that that was a Braxane and let's see what happens. We can always go back to just gem cis or something else or go into second line full fox. Um, so, so um, currently I've been stable even with the reduced doses. I don't show any other met metastatic spread. Um, I recently uh, received a second opinion. Since I produced this slide, uh, I did engage in a second opinion with Cleveland Clinic out of Ohio. Um, uh, I use Cleveland Clinic here in Toronto as my family practitioner um, uh, service. So uh, I'm, I'm allowed one free opinion a year. So I got a second opinion through Cleveland Clinic. They, they felt similar to Toronto. Uh, that it, at this point, operation or resection would be foolhardy and, and only add to my risks and not def, uh, be balanced out by um, the goal, which is the benefits of, of long-term survival. So that for now, they said, keep doing systemic treatment and uh, 
keep trying to find the right chemo concoction where we can actually see some definitive shrinkage and benefits that might indicate that whatever is metastatic is perhaps being eradicated. Um, I show you this graph quickly just to show my platelet journey. You could see the regression line going down from what used to be when I first started treatment um, in and around 210. And it's now re regression line standard is now showing below the minimum of 100 that we look for to allow for, for ongoing treatment via chemotherapy. Um, it's erratic and it's volatile, but it is trending down every time. So that's been, been one of my recent challenges. Um, my next steps, uh, I do feel really good. I actually am very active. I'm, I, I, I will have chemotherapy on a Saturday morning and I will go off and ski the entire afternoon and the next day with my family. Uh, and I don't mean just ski for, for the daytime. I'll, I'll, if there's night skiing, I'll ski till nine o'clock at night. And I just highlight that because there is opportunity for people to feel pretty good, even on systemic treatment. Like many people before me, I, I look at this as an acute, uh, sorry, not acute, a chronic disease um, that I maintain with, with medication, just like I did for, for nearly 20 years when I had Crohn's disease. I was constantly on some form of, 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 of medicine, either high-dose steroids, or I was on the um, uh, Humira and or Remicade, which were injectable drugs. So, so it's not the only time I've ever had to take medication. In fact, it seems to have been more the norm. Um, so I, 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 I think that you can be active if you're lucky. And I also work full time. I, I'm taking this call now from a board meeting here in downtown Toronto, and I'll be going back to that meeting as soon as, as, soon as I'm done. And I'll be playing back uh, later what I'm missing uh, before I can catch up again tomorrow. I've been experimenting substantially with diet. I've had a lot of nutritionists with varying backgrounds opine on, on what's the right thing to do to maintain overall just general good health. I try not to be too extreme. Um, but there's no question being healthier can't hurt, and diet is a key part of that. So I don't think that's ever a debate. The question is whether you go extreme uh, and, and do things that are maybe on the fringe, uh, and I, I'm trying to find that balance. That, that works for me. Uh, I know it doesn't work for everybody. Um, I mentioned the second uh, opinion, which I've subsequently got back. So I'd only been seeking it out when I was first putting this together, and I, was asking, I wanted their opinion on a high pec. Uh, given I only have these known three spots that show up anywhere in my peritoneum so far, um, they said that if I do find the right chemo and I do ultimately get uh, surgery, which they would recommend I get done locally here in Toronto since they're offering the same thing, that following stability of a minimum six months after that, if there's, if there's ever a reoccurrence or still further uh, suggestion through CA-99 or other markers, that there is, uh, there are live and, and healthy little cancer cells hidden somewhere. Um, they would then talk to me about HIPEC and we'd reassess. Even though that's not necessarily a good outcome for cholangiocarcinoma in many, in all cases, I, there are certainly some that have had good success. There just aren't that many that are at least uh, documented. Uh, that certainly not that I found, and that seemed to be uh, confirmed by Cleveland Clinic's uh, uh, expert panel uh, in my talks with them. Um, so I already talked about my finding the right systemic treatment, whether it be um, going back to a Braxane, whether it be uh, here in Canada, we have far fewer options on, on an oncology basis than are available in the US. FDA has got a lot more approvals in place for, for additional drugs that, that Health Canada doesn't yet. Um, so the next line would be a full Fox. Um, and now with the uh, uh, recent trials that were fast-tracked in the US uh, with reasonable success as an immune therapy with <laughs> Dervalumab, that might be something that we entertain here too. I would just likely have to pay for it or lobby to get uh, compassionate treatment from, the, uh, from uh, uh, AstraZeneca. And the other thing I'm doing, and this became very evident listening to the uh, folks present earlier today, especially a couple of the graphs that showed how many publications are coming online for cholangiocarcinoma over the last 20 years. You know, they, a lot of people say this, and it sounds cheeky when you're, when you're a patient struggling with, with a, 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 a dire prognosis long term. There's never been a better time to have cholangiocarcinoma than today. And uh, it seems awkward to even have those words come out of my mouth, but when you think to what you saw, there's no question that there's an all-time high over the last decade of research, trials, and therefore opportunities. So again, I, my wife and I, my family, we openly talk about this all the time. We look at it as I don't have to have a, a curative option available today. 
What I have to have is an ability to treat this as a chronic disease for, I look at things in year long chunks or maybe even in six month chunks so that other successful treatments may come online because the pace and the rapidity of new treatments is, is unprecedented. Um, so that, that's my ulterior goal. And I've already stated most of this, but if I, if I briefly scan what I've learned, I've learned that CA-99 is extremely sensitive to me. CA-99 was climbing from December 2019 till, this, till September 2020, and no one could find it, therefore treatment wasn't available. In hindsight, CA-99 was telling me I had a disease that possibly could have allowed me to get to, a, to a, a, a path forward faster than waiting for it to show up on imaging. So others tell me it's not, it's not a, a stable indicator, I shouldn't worry about it. Uh, I personally, as, as a personal advocate for myself, disagree. I'm, I look at my CA-99 as being far more evidence than a CT or an MRCP scan as to what's going on in my belly as far as activity with any malignancy. Um, the Cholangia Carcinoma Warriors social media group for me has been particularly essential as a resource. I, I can't believe how many ideas and options I'm getting uh, from the various patients perspectives. I often tell my oncology team, since it's such a rare cancer, on average oncologist, at least here in, in my local market, may only have two to 10 patients at any given time with cholangio. Um, whereas we've got about you know 800 plus patient perspectives online from around the world. And you'll never get better research into what's working, what's not working, and, and new opportunities than those 800 people in real time. Um, advocacy, everybody talks about advocacies. Um, I definitely have found I've had to take matters in my own hand. I push my surgeons very aggressively. Uh, they look at this as palliative because by default, there is no cure systemically. But palliative often means it's, it's, it's all about patient quality of life. Uh, I, 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 I'm very blunt, and when I talk to oncology, I said, I, I, your treatment path is, is just a slow death. I don't want slow death. I want opportunity at a longer life. And if that means I have to take more aggressive uh, risks uh, that might make me sicker in the short term, I'm willing to take those risks. I'm just looking for my medical partners to, to join me uh, on my journey to take those risks and give me access to certain treatments that aren't necessarily mainstay yet. And that hasn't been easy for me. I'm finding that it's, it's, it's been more traditionally stay in the middle lane and don't waver outside of those lanes. Um, so I've, I've, I'm not shy about finding new partners if I, I don't feel I'm getting the same aggressive um, pursuit uh, that match, matches my own pace. Um, I also put up my last bullet here about palliative care. I, I, I thought getting referred to my palliative department at Princess Margaret Hospital was giving up. That palliative meant you're, you're, you're going to just prepare for your last day. Um, I've been proven wrong. Palliative has been an ex excellent partner in my corner with, with just general health, with how do I sleep better? How do I make myself, you know, my body as healthy as possible so that I can best fight the disease? Um, and so having them in my corner and making sure I'm never uncomfortable, it, it's actually been a real morale booster for, for me and my family. And in turn, it's helped my body fight the cancer. And I, I, I believe in that. So, um, so that's, that's my story. And, and through that, I will say that, um, I'm actually very optimistic and I'm very positive. And uh, people tell me that all the time in my professional life and in my personal life. Um, but I believe, I truly believe that that it's that mind over matter dynamic. If you believe that there's opportunities around the corner on any given day, when you wake up to the time you go back to sleep again, uh, I believe you'll ha you have a better outcome and I believe you have a higher quality of life. And it's easy to say, hard to do, but it, it's my personal experience, and that's really what I'm here to share is my personal experience because it's what I know and it's what I have. Um, and finding your way to get to that healthy mindset is, is key. Um, talking to therapists, talking, for me, again, it was sleep aids. I just didn't sleep well, and I didn't realize how bad sleep was for me. I, I was the guy that didn't want to take any medication for something like sleep. I feel really stupid that I waited so long to get help so I could get a better sleep because I feel much, much better. So thanks for, for listening to my story. I put my, my personal email contact up on the slides. Uh, similarly, they can be played back. I, I love reach, have, having people reach out and I love sharing some of the things I'm doing. I'm actively involved in pursuing some uh, additional care out of the Asian market, given the high propensity for cholangio with, the, with anyone of Asian um, uh, ethnicity. Uh, my wife's from Hong Kong, so she's got me in touch with hospitals both in Taiwan and Beijing, and that's new for us. So. Um, as those stories unfold, I'm happy to share. But thank you, everybody, for your time today.
And we want to thank Scott. That was a great presentation. It's so helpful to hear um, a little more in depth about these patient journeys.